The Congo is one of the world's most powerful rivers, and it flows through the heart of Africa. Kisangani is the last stop before war-torn eastern Congo. It's a quiet town, based around life on the river. We're out with the Wagania fishermen. They use the impassable rapids to get their catch. It's a unique method that the Wagania master from an early age. They risk their lives far out into the rapids, funneling the white water through these huge wicker baskets to trap fish. Despite decades of war, it's a way of life that hasn't changed in hundreds of years. The fighting still rages on in the eastern Congo. We're with United Nations peacekeeping troops. After 20 years, they're still trying to stop militant groups killing civilians. On Saturday night, we had an attack of uh, alleged uh, ADF uh, fighters and at least 17 civilians got killed for uh, soldiers of the governmental army as well. So the situation in the city is currently very, very tense. Uh, the UN's Evert Ketz has a lot uh, in his hands right now, and he's just making sure we know what's going on. Uh, what I should say is actually welcome to the perfect storm, because uh, in the Benny uh, field office area of responsibility, we had already all these uh, security challenges, but meanwhile, uh, we also have an Ebola outbreak. Uh, well, you're on patrol with us, um, with the United Nations forces here, going out into quite a dangerous area. Uh, there's a bowler nearby, uh, and also there are, is a very strong um, militant group here that over the last few days has killed probably dozens of civilians. Basically, the group is called the ADF. Uh, they're a group that have been around 20 years and they're living in the forests. There's huge impenetrable forests just to the east of this area. They act in there, they do hit and run attacks, they kill civilians, they target UN vehicles like this one and they target the, uh, the local Democratic Republic of Congo forces as well. They're trying to reassure the locals they're here to protect them, while assessing just how dangerous it is on the ground. The sentries protecting the convoy are on high alert. So we're just uh, meeting one of the community leaders here with the troops before they go off on the proper foot patrol. But the translators just said that basically there's nobody from here on in further up to this side because of the, uh, the militants that are in the area. It's also weird because the kids around you normally would go hi there and shake hands. Can't touch anybody. I'm giving very strict instructions. Don't touch anybody because of the risk of Ebola in this area. Mm. They are requesting to the MONUSCO officers to add the number of uh, soldiers from uh, Tanzania, Malawi, or other countries so that they can surround everywhere in the town. They should be at the, the beginning of, of the town so that the enemy cannot come again and he came and he reached at town as he came to kill people in the middle of the town. 
The UN isn't popular here, as the attacks go on despite their presence. The villagers aren't reassured and are particularly suspicious of Western soldiers. The longer the patrol is out, the greater the risk of it being attacked. The Congolese government wants the UN out by 2020. I asked the force commander what he thought of that. I, uh, I believe that uh, UN is making the difference here because uh, the state is not present in many areas of this country. There are remote areas here where we don't see the presence of the state, the presence of the government. So if we left the, the area, I believe that uh, the situation based on the correct environment, the situation could worsen very quickly. When situations worsen in the DRC, this is what happens. People get forced from their homes and into camps. This is Kalemi. Two years ago, a local dispute displaced three quarters of a million people. They're queuing up to make sure they're on the list for cash payments. Aid workers make sure they don't get too little or too much of what they're entitled to. These camps sprung up across the whole region after the violence erupted. It's still too dangerous for most people to go home. And terrible things were done by both sides. We met Estelle. One morning, the war came to her village without warning. We ran away from the rebel war. We were in our village when the ambush took place. We were caught up in the attack and taken by the rebels. We were four men and three women. We were beaten and they burned down the village. They took us to the mountain. Once in the mountain, the rebels urinated on us. Me and another woman were tied up and every night we were raped by the rebels many times. The ordeal was unbearable. I felt a lot of pain in my stomach. Even now, I don't feel the need of being with a man. We were used as sex slaves for two weeks. We suffered seriously. It took Estelle two months to walk 200 kilometers to escape the fighting. She now struggles to feed her five children. Her four-year-old twins died here. The hillside is dry and exposed. The wind can whip up a small fire in no time. It's not surprising people panic. A nearby camp was recently burnt to the ground. Everyone lives on edge, and the slightest thing can spark a fight. This was over a young boy's burned possessions. You know, people here have just got absolutely nothing. And it's the figures that are amazing. Um, 14 million people in this country need some kind of aid every day just to stay alive. Five million people aren't living in their homes because they've been driven out by fighting. And we could have come to so many different places that look a bit like this. Here, hundreds of thousands of people have been driven from their homes. They're living in these kinds of camps that you can see and in the local communities where they're putting them up. You've heard just how brutally, how sadistically civilians are treated by these militia in these different places. It's just so traumatizing. And you know, there are scores of these armed groups all over the country. Usually it's about some strong man who just wants more power or it's got an ethnic edge to it. But also the fact the government just doesn't have control in these far flung parts of the country, that also plays into it as well. <laughs> Amid all the suffering, there's great hope that the country's new leadership can bring real change. Next episode, we look at Congo's vast potential and meet some of its most endangered wildlife.